Hello Thrivers, I'm going to forego the usual uh, video that you can skip using the chapter function just due to the nature of the fact that this is going to be another entry in a, I'm a narc, get me out of here. So that's a riff on the short-lived reality show I'm a Celebrity, get me out of here. Almost a survivor of sorts for celebrities, but the title itself just speaks uh, entitlement and I can tell you that these famous people maybe even Lindsay Lohan's mom uh, among them she can't even get home from a bar um, in Long Island without getting pulled over let alone survive in the wilderness um, although I love Lindsay Lindsay and my girl you're that you know what I mean but uh, you get the general picture so in this series we're going to take a look at a celebrity tend to be drawn toward fraudsters I know or criminals I know I've completed an episode on Ghislaine Maxwell um, Elizabeth Holmes and now we're going to be talking about SBF as he's known colloquially otherwise known as Sam Bankman Freed. Maybe I'm so fascinated because I think that it's their personality disorders lack thereof or empathy or lack thereof that made them criminals to begin with so I think there's just so much grist for the mill that they're worth talking about. The extent you're so fascinated or want to at least see what we theorize right of the DSM-5 then hang in this should be a fun episode. So I'm going to try to give you a bit of history before running down the list of uh, criteria in the DSM-5, having, you know, several, five or more typically is a strong indicator that someone has narcissistic personality disorder. Again, we're just certified professional life and happiness coaches and pop culture gluttons, uh, so you're in no position to do that diagnosing, we're just going to theorize. So do not think that I am a clinician that is giving an absolute diagnosis, we certainly aren't. We definitely have a right to access the DSM-5, we just can't diagnose people based on it. But we can theorize, and theorize we will. So before we go down the, the list and, and point to evidence, or the fact that there is no evidence, to support or not support that any of the criteria apply to SBF. If you've never heard of him, SBF first came to my attention in late fall 2022, November. He was the founder of the FTX cryptocurrency exchange and had heavy involvement in its sister company, Alameda Research, which was uh, run by CEO Carolyn Ellison, who met SBF at Jane Street, which is a very successful uh, firm in securities training that takes calculated but uh, proven risks to uh, gain return on investment for its clients. They have a very vigorous interview process, a lot of probability, uh, complex mathematics that they're trying to basically gauge how well you can use math and probability to take calculated risks uh, that pay off and also kind of measure your aversion to or your um, whether it's an aversion to risk taking or whether you are a risk taker I think there's kind of a few different purposes there certainly not you know the typical interview the rest of us go through so I think it's safe to say that uh, when it comes to math uh, SBF and Carolyn Ellison you know knew what they were talking about when it came to being responsible with customer funds and you know making safe bets that uh, that that knowledge seemed to fly out the window or at least didn't serve them in those situations but basically in November 2022 FTX became a quickly insolvent um, some call it you know a run on withdrawals so with the value uh, of F FTX plummeting customers started to make you know or cash in on their investments as soon as they could uh, therefore not giving FTX the liquidity to keep up with the demand for withdrawals and remain solvent at the same time. I believe his name is John uh, J. Ray or John Ray. He's since been brought in as like a bankruptcy liquidation expert to try to make FTX customers as whole as possible uh, and to navigate the bankruptcy process for FTX. Maybe it's, um, you know, going to end up solvent enough to fall in a responsible businessman's hands and be run the right way, if not by John Ray, by somebody else. Let me know if I got that or any information or details about this case incorrect in the comments. You know, keep me honest. That'll help educate our other viewers of this video and ensure that I'm not providing, you know, fake news. <clears throat> 
In any event, in November 2022 is when we saw the big downfall. By December 2022, he'd been arrested. SBF and FTX did business out of their headquarters in a gorgeous townhome in the Bahamas. Uh, the Bahamas has been known, or the government of Bahamas has been known to be very friendly toward cryptocurrency exchanges and cryptocurrency in general. And even though there's a lack of regulation in the United States, you know, there were certain advantages to FBF, uh, you know, making that his home and doing business for FTX, um, you know, from that luxury townhouse in the Bahamas, not least of which probably given the fact that their loosey-goosey standards allowed them to perpetuate one of the largest financial frauds in U.S. history, but, you know, who am I to say really, right? Um, he was initially let out on bail. After, well, he was in Fox Hill Prison in, in the Bahamas until he was extradited. And he initially, maybe, I don't know, spent a day or two, or maybe no time at all, in the Metropolitan Detention Center. There's the MDC and the MCC. One of them is in Brooklyn. One of them, I think, is in Manhattan. And neither one of them is anywhere you want to be at any point for any length of time ever in your life. Um, and he was able to post the bill and he did not have to initially suffer through that. Um, he was given very strict guidelines by Judge Kaplan as far as confinement in his parents' home, which I believe was on the Stanford University campus. They're both professors there. However, I guess not restrictive enough that he wasn't able to entertain a journalist, at least one, if not more, uh, to visit his parents' house so he could yet again give his side of the story. And that's something he did a lot um, after the collapse of FTX and before the indictment came, and the, the arrest and the indictment and the extradition and all the rest of it came down. Um, you know, I'm sure he had the best lawyers in the world, you know, advising him at that point, and he went against all advice and started to sing like a canary and every time he tried to make something better it seemed like he only made it worse reporters were prepared for him uh, they knew exactly what to ask him to back him up against the wall and sometimes he was better than others at you know pushing back but uh, ultimately it was seen as a foolish foolish endeavor and one that would hurt him and did hurt him at trial while on bail sbf had the bright idea to leak portions of caroline ellison's diary while out on bill, SBF had the bright idea of releasing some of Caroline Ellison's personal diary entries, and Judge Kaplan ruled that was witness tampering. So maybe a, an opportunity or an attempt by SBF to intimidate Caroline Ellison, who along with Gary Wang and others in the company were uh, cooperating with the prosecution. Uh, SBF kind of stood alone in maintaining his innocence and wanting to take the case to trial. It's worth noting, and I may get the exact st uh, statistic incorrect, but I think 90 to 95 percent or even higher um, percentages of defendants in white collar federal criminal cases really get an acquittal. So the odds were stacked against them from the beginning, but in true SBF style, I think he thought he could turn that around and that he would. So I think his hubris, you know, allowed him to stay in the game longer than his co-workers who admitted their guilt, immediately expressed remorse, seemed, uh, seemed uh, heartfelt, and began, uh, and began cooperating with the prosecution. So since his bail was revoked in August after doing that to Carolyn Ellison, he did spend the rest of his time uh, in the Metropolitan Detention Center and Jeffrey Epstein and Glenn Maxwell were both at the MDC and MCC respectively, and their rat-infested, dirty, dank cells with really no communication outside of, at least based on what I understand, their lawyers. Um, I bet his lawyers just couldn't get enough communication with him, but uh, he didn't seem to really need it from them. But uh, you're really limited to, I think, just pondering how you got where you got and preparing for trial with, with your lawyers, and that's what he did. <clears throat> in any event, his case finally went to trial in October 2023, and in January 2024, he was convicted on all seven counts, which included wire fraud, conspiracy to commit fraud, money laundering, uh, and he even had some campaign finance violation um, charges brought against him. There was going to be a second trial. But my understanding is that 
those charges were dropped given the fact that prosecutors were able to get a you know across the board sweeping uh, conviction on all counts from Sam Bankman Freed. Based on the counts and the federal sentencing guidelines, I think the prosecution suggested 45, 50 years, and maybe they thought he was most likely going to get that, making you know that second trial redundant and not giving them any more benefit uh, and spending the taxpayers' dollars to bring him to justice on that, given the fact that he was just sentenced or just uh, convicted of seven counts in a federal court like we just mentioned. And I know in the end of March, he was sentenced to 25 years, so definitely less than the prosecution asked for, definitely a lot more than the defense asked for. But I think Judge Kaplan was fair in handing down a sentence that met the severity of the crimes, but gives SPF a chance to be a better person and have a semblance of, of a life for quite a while You know, when his prison stint is over. And I think inmates in federal prisons can get uh, good t- good time or get time shaved off their sentences and maybe even serve only up to 85% of their sentence uh, if they demonstrate good behavior. So he could be out a little bit sooner than that, so still plenty enough time given of age to course correct and do right by people, but uh, we'll see what happens or where we're at in 25 years. <clears throat> With that being said, you know, I'll fill in the blanks on some other aspects of the story as we go through the list, but the DSM-5 Define some of the uh, narcissistic personality disorder as being grandiose with expectations of superior treatment from other people, fixated on fantasies of power, success, intelligence, and attractiveness. I think SBF threw us for a loop here and that that attractiveness piece, nah, not so much. And if he thinks he was pursuing unlimited attractiveness, then that Bahamian townhouse was in need of uh, something more than the funhouse mirrors they had installed because he was goofy looking as heck. A um, couple pictures, I think the, the photo shoot he did for Forbes, he ended up look, cutting a handsome figure, but that was the only time I've seen him, he didn't look like a schlep. Uh, but I think that was all calculated. I think we know that narcs are very calculated, most of it is a facade, and I think he was trying to disarm people, come across as non-threatening, kind of nerdy, kind of, you know, not capable of doing the egregious things that he did. Uh, So even though he didn't pursue unlimited attractiveness, he certainly played down his potential attractiveness in the pursuit of power, success, and in furthering his intelligence and in the name of effective altruism, no less, which is a movement that prescribes to making a ton of money and giving most, if not all of it, to good causes to impact positive change in the world. But After an audit of where the money went, I think there was a lot less effective altruism than there was gifting parents multi-million dollar homes, uh, setting up shop in a multi-million dollar, you know, town home for FTX, and just so much other money that was blown on just frivolous things that, uh, not to mention customer funds on, you know, risky bets by giving Alameda Research an unlimited credit line. Uh, that they could use to make those bets with huge losses as a result and uh, without having to post collateral at that. Needing continual admiration from others. Uh, oh, actually, I skipped one. Sorry. Self-perception of being unique, superior, and associated with high-status people or institutions. <clears throat> Needing continual admiration from others. Sense of entitlement to special treatment and to obedience from others. Exploitative of others to achieve personal gain. Unwilling to empathize with the feelings, thoughts, or needs of other people. Intensely envious of others and the belief that others are equally envious of them. And pompous or having an arrogant demeanor. From the jump, let's just cross off the ones I don't think apply. And maybe highlight a few I definitely think apply that I can give strong evidence supporting our theory, not our diagnosis, that you may have MPD. The ones I want to give him a pass on are needing continual admiration from others. He certainly used his power and influence to try to do just that, influence, and politicians no less. Not a whole lot on the record about him needing to be admired, and also um, there's not a whole lot documented that I've read or heard or uh, watched that indicates he was envious of others or wanted people or thought people were envious to be or thought people were envious of him. So I was actually going to give him a pass on both of those. Some that jump out right away, um, you know, grandiosity with expectations of superior treatment. This is a man that gave $40 million to you know, the Democrats during the, uh, the midterms. 
He's also on record as giving a fair amount of money to Republicans, too. So I think he wanted to have, be vested no matter which way the wind blew and have politicians uh, that had a special interest in him and keeping him insulated if they were elected and, and reached the, the land where promises go to die, Washington, uh, D.C. So if you think that you could just throw money at politicians and shape the way they define or uh, legislate policy and continue to be unregulated and unchecked and so you can perpetrate a fraud, there's some grandiosity there, I think. Uh, I also think that he had a very big sense of entitlement. Uh, first of all, he went against lawyer advice. He had one of the, I'm sure he has one of the best legal teams that money could buy. And anybody, I think even the everyday criminal knows that uh, anything that you say can be used against you in a court of law. Usually you follow your lawyer's ex uh, you know, advice not to, not to talk. Uh, we even saw that with Elizabeth Holmes, who we hadn't heard a peep from until she took the stand in her own trial. Very different from SBF, who I think was on Forbes, Fortune, uh, via satellite, via Zoom, in person, I think with George Stephanopoulos, just interviews all over the place trying to assert that FTX was solvent, if he could just roll up his sleeves, get in there and help, that he takes ownership and was sorry for what happened, although I tend to think that that was cognitive empathy and not genuine empathy. Um, and so, I, you know, definitely a, a sense of entitlement to think that, you know, his lawyers don't know best because, you know, the bar exam's you know, easy to pass. And also because, you know, there's an anecdote when he was in prison, you know, he requested Adderall to be able to um, focus on his trial. Obviously, he had a dependency on it. Um, has he been taking it for a while? And his lawyers filed a motion to make sure he got that Adderall. I've never been to prison. I know some folks who have, and no famous ones, of course, but I can tell you that, you know, regardless of what medications you're on on the outside, you, if you get them, if you get them, when they get around to giving them, right? You don't just have lawyers file a motion and finally, voila, voila your medication shows up. Not only that, but when Judge Kaplan did grant the request, I believe they even pushed back saying the dosage wasn't strong enough, preventing him from keeping focus throughout an entire trial day. That's one heck of an accommodation to make for someone. You're in prison for however long awaiting trial after your bill was revoked in August, sleep it off, dude. Sleep it off. Get through the brain fog and just uh, get back to normal and figure it out. Many people before you have done it and many people since will do it. And uh, they're not going to have the benefit of being able to bail themselves out or the benefit of having lawyers, you know, submit uh, briefs or uh, motions to, to get your medication. You're left to fend for yourself in the uh, at least that I know of in jail, state prison, or even federal prison, based on accounts I've seen and watched, and people I've known, the people I've people I've known that have experienced uh, something similar. So I think that shows an incredible amount of entitlement. Also, the fact that he thought he was going to testify at his trial when ninety to ninety-five percent of federal defendants in white collar criminal cases do end up with a guilty verdict. Uh, maybe he thought that was the only chance he had and there is some research to suggest that in white collar criminal federal cases, you know, the jury's most likely or only likely to return a not guilty verdict if they can hear the story from you yourself and it sounds credible. I think Elizabeth Holmes did a fairly good job of this, ex aside from having selective amnesia whenever it came to the cross-examination. Excellent memory when it came to the defense. Prosecution, it was it was a whole bunch of I don't recall. I, I think I did. I, I might have. I don't know if I did in that context. Um, SPF wasn't as cautious, and he just was up over with a shovel, and he just kept digging and digging and digging and digging. And it didn't do him any favors because he was convicted on all counts. So, you know, the entitlement of being on house arrest after posting bail and bypassing restrictions to get an interview with the journalist releasing your CEO's diaries because she's prosecuting with the government. You want to intimidate her to increase your chances of saving your own hide. Um, giving interviews clearly against counsel's advice. Uh, it, anything you say can be used against you in a court of law, and it was. And it didn't help when he got up in the stand and regurgitated the same garbage he did in those interviews. Exploitative of others to achieve personal gain. I'm going to have to say, duh, that's what this whole case is about and why it's one of the largest criminal 
financial fraud cases in U.S. history, right up there with Bernie Madoff, and there's a reason that he was convicted on all accounts. He definitely exploited people, made a lot of money doing it, blew a lot of money doing it, with really no checks and balances to make sure there was responsible oversight or use of customer funds. Commingling funds is a no-no in securities and really in cryptocurrency or any type of trading, and they were absolutely guilty of that. Finally, I'm willing, oh, not finally, but I'm willing to empathize with the feelings, wishes, and needs of other people. Like I said earlier, I think he was good at cognitive empathy, knowing he should show some remorse and trying to do that. It didn't seem heartfelt to me. I don't think his address in court upon sentencing when he got the 25 years he did was uh, you know, very emotional. Um, I don't think he's a very emotional person. I know his mother said he doesn't feel things. So if you don't feel things, then I guess you don't feel empathy for others as well, which would give him a yes in that box. Uh, and then skipping over intensely envious, which we gave him a pass on, pompous and arrogant demeanor. I think we've given ample evidence to determine that there was some pompous and arrogant behavior here. Just the hubris and pride of thinking that you're that special defendant that is going to turn it all around just with the magic of a simple, simple to understand explanation from an unassuming nerdy guy. Uh, that's not who he was. That's not who he proved to be. I think his convictions are testament to that. And I think it was incredibly pompous and arrogant of him to think that uh, on each stop along the way, he alone, despite his lawyer's advice, you know, could save himself, even when the odds were stacked against him and all of his right-hand men and women were <laughs> cooperating with the government. Never a good sign when everybody else folds and cooperates the government. Not really sure why he took that one to trial. You know, maybe he figured he was damned if he did, damned if he wasn't, or didn't. I would say he was just damned because he did, and uh, that 25 years reflects that. So I'm giving him grandiosity, fantasies of power, self-perception of being unique in that he had abilities uh, that others didn't when it came to like mathematics and risk-taking and cryptocurrency um, and you know just being unique in being the guy to uh, be so unique and superior that they could play League of Legends while they're on a call with investors and they're about to plunk down millions of dollars on your exchange um, as an investment as if you, you could care less, right? Um, I didn't really have a case for needing continual admiration. Definite sense of entitlement. That Adderall example stands out to me. It's one of a hundred examples. We would be here all day if I provided all of them. Let me know if you disagree in the comments. There was a lack of empathy here all around. No envy that I saw, but his pompous and arrogant demeanor and pride and hubris, I think is why he'll be spending 25 years in the federal prison that Judge Kaplan has chosen for him, if that hasn't already been chosen already. Have I missed any details about the story that you think are important to this assessment? Drop them in the comments. Do you disagree with my assessment that he has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven of the nine criteria which based on our theory would give him NPD not a diagnosis of NPD we're not qualified to do that but that's our theory is it your theory let me know why or why not in the comments I hope you enjoyed this rundown a little bit of a departure from the normal video a little bit more fun frivolous uh, working or talking about celebrities we're all familiar with and then evaluating them and, and seeing where we think they fall on the, on the spectrum of narcissism. We all know that we have a little bit of it, but it's when it's disordered that it becomes a problem. So I uh, hope that uh, you enjoyed today's content. Hit that like button if you did. Like I said, consider becoming a Thriver Medallion member by subscribing. Until we meet again in the next uh, piece of content, whether it be a short or a long form, Thrivers, stay up.